Hi, this is John Donny, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio podcast. Oh, yes, quite so. Yes, of course, I do know the medium. G'day audiophiles, welcome to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. My name is Dwayne. And my name is Dwayne. <laughs> my name's not Dwayne. No. My name is Philip. G'day Dwayne. That was G'day. a bit timey-wimey. Oh, it was. Hey, audiophiles. <laughs> <laughs> Been a big day. <laughs> g'day, g'day Philip. Um, we've got a, a great show lined up today. We, we're going to have a chat with... Uh, one of the long-term writers uh, of Big Finish, uh, Jonathan Morris, or Johnny Morris, as he likes to be called. Um, so it's going to be fascinating having a chat with him uh, because he's done some of some of the very best uh, uh, in uh, the Big Finish range. You'd have to agree, wouldn't you? Oh, I mean, certainly. he's still going. So he is it's amazing stories and yeah, real classic in there amongst so much stuff. Yep, absolutely. Uh, but be- before we have uh, our in-depth chat with Johnny. You know what I see up ahead, Philip? Oh no, with my brain, this is going to be great. Oh, here we go. It's a rabbit hole. Me, me. <laughs> okay, so only a really quick rabbit hole and not really anything too controversial, but I just want to talk to you and get your thoughts because I haven't spoken to you at all about this since we got this news a few days ago. Uh, the news that the Eighth Doctor and Charlie are being reunited uh, in a box set coming out in just a few months' time. How do you feel about it, Philip? Well, I think Big Finish obviously listened to our podcast from early in the year <laughs> when we were celebrating the 20th anniversary of it all starting with the two of them, and they worked out we were right, and they've commissioned a box set and they've put it out there now. Really? You think it was recorded after that? Oh, well, yes, definitely. They've, they've, they've just released well, it, which means it's only just been recorded recently. It's coming out in January. So, yeah, for what we know of how Big Finish works, yeah, I think they listened to our podcast, took our suggestions seriously. There was time for a box set, like they did with Lucy and the Eighth Doctor. And, yeah, they, yeah, I think Big Finish now is doing what we, we suggest. I think we're in, a, in an amazing point in time in Doctor Who fandom history, uh, if you can call it such a thing. In that, uh, this is this is a celebration of twenty years since the Eighth Doctor. It's a it's a heck of a long time. You think about twenty years of the actual television show. We had gone from uh, a police box standing in a junkyard to the Five Doctors and the Death Zone on Gallifrey. That is the amount of time that's gone past since then. It's pretty amazing. It is. It is amazing. We were chatting with someone only recently, which you'll find out about soon who talked about the fact that they were 14 when Christopher Eccleston started on the show, and that made me feel so, so old. And, and is now one of the professional writers for Big Finish, who's not young anymore, either. Yeah. But, but it really made me feel old that yeah, he was 14 when the show came back, because he, yeah, he, was, he was before the... He was in that mid-period of No Doctor Who, and now he is writing, producing other stuff. So, yeah, it, that, it is unbelievable how much time has passed since New, New Who has come back. It really isn't new who anymore. And we're coming up to a 60th anniversary. And of course, you know, the show started long before we were born, for goodness sake. But yeah. uh, we still love it and hold it out for it. And I say 20 years since Charlie and the Eighth Doctor started. And uh, you know, if, you, if you actually, if you've seen our tweets, we've got some photos up from, from the recording and they're looking as young as ever. So it's disgusting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Um, yeah, you just think about that. In, in 1983, for the 20th anniversary, I was I was 10 years old, so I was really, really getting into Doctor Who in my early to mid-teens. And um, there was people around then, people writing Peter, the Peter Haining books, I was devouring those, so there was a lot of nostalgia there for those black and white days. Now we're looking at new fans coming along, or sort of appearing in the, uh, in the fandom zeitgeist, uh, 
actually writing things, making fan things, even working for Big Finish for the TV series, who are looking back on Eccleston as the nostalgia. Mm. Uh, it, it does indeed make me feel extremely old. But it's also it, exciting. It's been on far longer now than we were watching it before it was cancelled after Sylvester. Yes. So, that, so it, it's, you know, it's been running now far longer than from when we got excited by it originally, even though it had already been on for years before that. But yeah, in, in terms of, yeah, it's, it's huge what's going on. Um, in, in terms of how I'm feeling, by the way, you know, you know that to me, Charlie and the Eighth Doctor are the perfect companions. She was, when, when Big Finish wanted to sit down and write the ultimate companion for the Eighth Doctor, they came up with Charlie, and I think they were right. I think that they were spot on with her. And so, yeah, the, the fact that they're reuniting for four episodes, four stories, and and I just love what's in the box set. So they've got an Alan Barnes, of course, who first introduced Charlie in Storm Warning. He's doing the first one in the box set. And they've got the sequel to Ivor... I'm going to say this wrong, though, isn't it? The Sword of Orion. Sword of Orion by, by Nicholas Briggs. So he's rewritten a sequel to it. Then you've got some of the original cast from that come back, as well as having Charlie and the Doctor. So two of those in the box set are going to be beautiful little nostalgia links to the first twenty years, and of course they've got two of the best new writers coming on board as well. So it's going to be going to be interesting in that the box set's going to have uh, like at least two part, if not one hour, stories within them, isn't it? So you know, it's something that the that the Eighth Doctor and Charlie have not had a lot of, if any. Can you think of any short stories that they've ever had? That's a good point. There was a freebie. Actually, there's a freebie with her dressed up as a Time Lord. I'm trying to think what that is. That was given away with Big Finish. That was an hour special. But I can't quite think so of that. So one. I can think of one. But yeah, aside from that, it was always four episode stories because it was always part of the monthly range. So apart from it being very nostalgic, it's also something new for this team too. Yeah. But I, you know, I think we all know that Doctor Who's moved on in some ways and the four part story, as I, yeah, you know, I think... I think the one-hour specials work tighter and better than the, the, the four 25-minute parts. So I'm looking forward to seeing both the, both the Doctor and Charlie in this tighter format. Very good. Let's jump out of this rabbit hole uh, on that level of excitement. We'll throw in something written by Jonathan Morris, and we'll be back with him in just a second. Cryo suspension revival complete. Subject regaining consciousness. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, Time Lord Victorious, Genetics of the Daleks. He was right. This unit has been opened and emptied. Captain? Yes, Swan? Someone's been down here, removing alloys and replication tech. I I'm afraid I'm as much in the dark as you are. All I can tell you is, I'm here to help. Probably means you're in terrible danger. Intruder defense system activated. I will kill you for this! I was wondering, if it's not too much to ask, whether you'd mind terribly locking me up somewhere else, somewhere more secure. But even so, it's just one Dalek. Oh, it's just one Dalek? <laughs> Famous last words of countless civilizations. You have done well. They do not suspect. The machine you created for me activated. Yes. Big finish. We love stories. They say that writing is one of the loneliest professions in the world. And when you look at the huge output of today's guests with novels, short stories, comics, blogs, and dozens of audio stories across every range of Big Finish, today's guest might be one of the loneliest people alive. Anyhow, Johnny Morris, welcome to our program. Great to have you here. So are you a lonely man? <laughs> uh, that, that's, a, that's an interesting introduction. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been very lucky. I mean, I, I know people, other people in lockdown have been, have been on their own, but I've obviously I've got my... Uh, wife and my son to keep me company so um I, I treasure my moments of loneliness i um i arrange them in advance so i can get some work done but um most of the time i'm with i'm in company which is lovely so but yes writing is a lonely sad desperate bleak profession 
Well, I mean, your, your output is just astounding. Do you, do you want to tell us a bit about early on, though, in terms of where did you grow up? Um, and what was it that made you be, decide to become a writer? Um, well, I, I wrote lots of stories when I was a, a child, and um, I won a competition with a story called them. Um, it's called the Magic Television Set, uh, which sort of, and I was encouraged by teachers going, you're good at this. You're, and when people say you're good at something, you keep going. And when I was about, when about 12 to about 14, my, my hobbies were computer games, programming, and making up Doctor Who stories. And it wasn't like the whole novel or the whole script. It was just a synopsis. Um, it'd be about like, um, 500 words per episode and I'd just do that over and over again until I sort of got a hand, handle on sort of structure because I would work out oh the how event one event follows another and I'd keep getting to the end of the story and I'd go bad guys have won because <laughs> I didn't think of a way of Doctor Who to defeat them so um so things like that you sort of I sort of learned and then I sort of went off into another life for uh, about 10 or 10 years or so until I sort of got dragged back into Doctor Who fandom in the late 90s and um, I was reading some of the books that had come out and they were sort of encouraging because uh, they were either really really good um, like uh, some of the ones by um, Gareth Roberts uh, some of his Mystic Adventures and some other stuff by people like Lance Parker and Steve Lyons and stuff it was really Really, really good. But also, they were publishing ones which were terrible as well, <laughs> which I thought was terrible, and um, which gave me the sort of uh, 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 inkling that they were quite keen to find more writers. Because they're going, well, if they pub it's this thing going to be, and if they publish that, they'll probably publish me because I might not be very good, and I didn't think I was very good. But I go, well, if I try really, really hard, I can probably do better than that book they just published. Um, I can't remember which books I'm thinking about, but there, there, there were some. Um, and so I sent in an idea to Justin Richards uh, called, um, which became Festival of Death, my first sort of Doctor Who book. And that sort of just kicked the whole thing off, really, because um, as I got, as I did that, the Jack Rayner, who was working as Justin Richards' assistant editor at the time, and sort of recommended me to Gary Russell at Big Finish. And Gary already knew who I was because um, we were sort of, uh, he was, we were both sort of Erasure fans and there was another sort of fandom we were both in. So he knew of me and knew that I could write stuff. So, um, so he commissioned me to do Blood Tide, which was, and then so I was written more or less twice at the beginning of Big Finish. I was, I was there at that first party where, um, to, to celebrate the release of Sirens of Time. And although I've gone away and come back about three or four times since then, I have kept coming back. Okay. So, so Festival of Death was actually your first major work. So you, major novel was your first work? In terms of fiction, yes. I mean, I'd, I'd written, I've been working, writing a magazine and doing um, sketches and stuff for BBC Radio 4 and stuff like that. But um it was certainly my first major Doctor Who thing. I'd done a, a couple of short stories before that, um, but that was all. And it won the Doctor Who magazine best book of the year. It did. I was, I was delighted. With, um, it went down, I would say beyond my wildest dreams, but I'm a writer. I have pretty wild ideas. <laughs> and to be honest, I, I was going, I was, when I was writing, I was in two states of going, this is all terrible. I need to rewrite it until it gets better. And then I'd move into the second state, which is, this is so brilliant. This is so brilliant. It's kind of spooky. Um, and I, th I think um, reading, I had to read it again when they republished it. Um, and it sort of starts getting good around chapter five when I work out how to write a book. <laughs> the first four chapters I'm pretending I know how to write a book. But then by chapter five, it's going, oh, you just, you just sit there and let the story carry you along. That's what you do. And yes, I, I remember um, meeting, meeting Mark Gatiss at um, party and I was leaving just as he was arriving. So I only had time <laughs> to tell him, going, 
hey, Mark, I beat you in the poll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's, the only, that's probably the only time I've beaten Mark Gatiss in anything by 0.5%. And he, he's probably just sort of sound going, who the hell was that? <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I, I, I remember that very well. So you mentioned before you started writing as a kid Doctor Who story. So how did you first get into Doctor Who? Um, well, this is, oh, this is way back in the 1970s when um, Doctor Who was very big in, um, in the playgrounds uh, at my um, primary school, so um, everyone who had a television uh, watched it really, and uh, I sort of, because Doctor Who wasn't on all year round, um, the way you'd become a fan would be you'd be reading the Target novelizations, and you'd be getting Doctor Who weekly and Doctor Who monthly, which would sort of encourage you to go further. You know, it was always the Target books would. Would always have little asterisks at the bottom of the page going, see another story, or they'd have a list of other books on the back. And uh, Doctor Who magazine would have an episode guide going, there's all these stories from like the William Hartnell era and Patrick Chad and John Pook, and they all sound really cool. And I'm going, yes, I want to see them. In some cases, I'm going, I still do want to see them. Uh, but um, that sort of just sort of sets you on that sort of road, I think, of, um, of a sort of a positive feedback loop because I just found Doctor Who incredibly exciting. Certainly when I was about 10 years old, when it was around the time of uh, Arc of Infinity and Snake Dance and stuff like that, I, I was in a, sta a sort of state of absolute high-pitched excitement for the Saturday afternoon. No, this would be a Wednesday evening, wouldn't it? Or Thursday, because Doctor Who was in the week. But it was I was in a sort of state of extreme excitement before Doctor Who. And when I got a video recorder, that sort of doubled the anxiety because not only did I have to watch Doctor Who, I had to record it and I had to record it perfectly on a video recorder, which didn't always work and with tapes that didn't always work. And so, so it's incredibly stressful, <laughs> um, but, it, but with the stress, it brings you joy. It's like, being, you know, like any sort of fandom, the, you get highs and lows and they sort of, the highs make the lows worthwhile. Yeah. So are there particular target novels that you really st strike you in terms of they had a big influence in terms of that was great writing? Certainly reading them, I would, I would get the, a handle on which writers I liked. I really liked um, Terence Dix and Malcolm Hulk. I thought they were the, one, the best ones. And there are other writers who are sort of slightly more, I don't know what the word is, but uh, highbrow, they're aiming for but they're, they're things like, I remember feeling very proud when I finally got through Doctor Who and the Crusaders, I found that hard work. <laughs> and, I, and I remember making many, many attempts to try and get into Doctor Who and the Ribos operation, which I don't know if you've read it, but it has a page just describing the Doctor's hat. And then it has a page describing the Doctor. And then it has a page describing K9. And then the page, you're going, just stop. And then by the end of the story, it's just going, chapter 12. They run through a corridor, exploded, they won. And you go, this is how not to balance out your word count when writing a novel. Um, well, Victor Hugo, Victor Hugo spends 70 pages describing the, the uh, sewers of Paris. So, yeah, yeah I mean, a page and a hat could be, could be worse. But it's, it's, it's one of those things when you're starting a story, you sort of, you're worried about meeting your word count. So you over sort of over describe things. And then um, really you should go back and cut all that out because one thing I... I learned from reading the books, which I keep with me to this day, is um, I would pick up the target book of, you know, I don't know, Stones of Blood or whatever. And I'd flip through it until the first bit with the doctor in. And I'd start reading from there. And then I'd keep reading. And if there was a scene without the doctor or Romana or a canine or whatever, I'd skip that bit and then go to the next scene with the doctor, Romana or canine. Um, because the story still made sense that way. It still worked perfectly, and it was just a much faster way. Because you know, there'd be so many of these books. I don't, you know, the sort of thing where there'd be four pages of two bored pilots in a spaceship discussing their jobs, and then there'd be an accident, and you go, "I didn't need to know any of that. They're dead." <laughs> or, um, you know, it'd be a priest and a sort of a scientist arguing for four pages about which is better, science or religion. And you just go, well, none of this is necessary. So, 
And that's how I write, that while I'm writing stories, I bear that in mind of going, just skip the bit. Don't, you know, don't bore us, get to the chorus, just start with the doctor and his companions arriving. That is the story. What happens before they get involved uh, isn't really, it isn't the story. The story is about them. So, so yeah, that's, that's the sort of big lesson I've taken from it. And uh, I think that's sort of, I get the impression that's a lesson that, you know, people like uh, Russell T. Davis have followed too, because they do it very much so as well. So you mentioned before how you uh, did your first novel and then almost threw away Gary Russell employed you to do Big Finish. Yeah. Did you find it, were you too inexperienced as a writer at that stage to know, know that you know, writing novels, writing audio were very different skills? You seem to flip between novels to short stories, blogs, I mentioned you know, comics. Do you, do you find diff- different styles of writing more challenging than others? Comic strips are much more challenging because you have to describe everything. And so, a, you know, a frame might, have, have, might only have a character going, I, or something. But you have, to, you have to do like 300 words describing that picture in a sort of, um, in sort of film sort of jargon of, you know, wide shot, close up, zooming in and stuff. Um, and that's just so time consuming. That's just a real sort of slog to describe all this stuff that, um, which is there for the artist's benefit. And it's not for, no, no reader's gonna ever know about it. So that's the difficult one, I think. Um, with audio, there's lots of things to learn. And I was very lucky that Gary Russell sort of was acting as a sort of, you know, a teacher during the first process of um, how to establish a setting without having people saying where they are, um, how to get in and out of scenes, the sort of the grammar of, um, if, some, if a character's in a scene, you need to have them talk, you know, in the first page of that scene to establish that they're there and all that, all that sort of stuff, which, um, I mean, I, I, in the end, I ended up writing sort of a, a how to write a Big Finish audio guide for Big Finish because I'd done so many that there were so many sort of things you need to know um, that, that you, through trial and error. But, um, but I, I got the hang of it fairly quickly, I think. I mean, the only thing that um, ever annoys me with Bloodside, um, really, is that it's too long. And it's too long because I thought when I was writing it... Um, that I'd write half an hour episodes, you know, about um, 5,500 words or 6,000 words. And then it would be edited down. I thought it'd be edited down to 25 minutes um, because that's how, that's how it's always done on television and stuff. Um, but what was released wasn't really edited down. I mean, Aston Locke did add, edit it down a tiny bit, but I would have gone through it all and got it down to 25 minute episodes, which, um, just just cutting out stuff which um, slows it down, really. Just so that the good bits are closer together, so you don't have to wait f- so long for the next good bit. Um, but that's, apart from that, I think it turned out really, really well. Doctor Who. Blood Tide. There's something in here. Some sort of lizard, I think. Please, I saw them. The Bible tells us that this world of ours is a mere 6,000 years old. By the lake, Elhugo! That the Lord created in six days, that there was but one flood. Devils! With three eyes I saw them! It's about the size and proportions of a man, two arms, two legs. They are here! So to my mind, these fossils should not exist. And now they have come back. Yes. Yes, they have come back. And we're not we're not going to go through every single release that you did because <laughs> <laughs> because your your memory probably uh, won't help you out there too much. But the very next one after Blood Tide that you did in, in the Doctor Who range was Flip Flop. So a, a very highly experimental uh, style story was that all your idea to come up with that that story, um, or was it uh, was it Gary's idea? Uh, no, that was certainly entirely my idea. Um, I take all the credits and all the blame for football um and it was it was that time it was a time of um trying to 
because there's no no sign of Doctor Who ever coming back on television at that point. Um, and Big Finish had done a few sort of slightly experimental things. Um, you know, I don't know, I like... Um, the Pirates, the musical, there was... Um, yeah, I don't, think, I don't know if they'd come out by that point. I think... The, um, the mix-up stories, yeah, there's a few things happening. I think The Holy Terror had come out, and The Holy Terror was... And I'd, I'd listened to um, The One Doctor had come out, because that was a big influence on it. So it was sort of pushing things, and I, I was... I was sort of desperate for attention to show off. And so I'd go, well, I'll try and do something which no one has ever done before. Um, and to tell a two-part story where the two parts can be listened to in either order. I think I got carried away with the idea, to be honest, and it gets very, very complicated. I was going to say, for people who haven't listened to Flip Flop, it was the first release where there was no A or B. I think it's a, a white and a black, and you can play yeah. them in any order. It doesn't matter which order you play them. It's the same, well, the story gets told the same way. Yeah, you're right. It is the same story. Both oh, well, that's <laughs> that's not, not quite true. There's, no, that's yeah. not true. But it doesn't matter. No. It, it tells a story, but it doesn't matter which order you listen to it to. It's very, I mean, it's very yeah. clever. Very clever. It is very, I mean, there's, there's things I like, the, the, the sort of the Back to the Future 2 type time stuff of people running around in their own scenes is, very complicated but it was very hard very very you know it's, it's so intricate i would never do anything like that now um and the, some of the politics works and some of it doesn't i think um sort of the whole point of the whole exercise was um the idea that you can judge the past based on what you think might have been you know the whole idea of um if uh if neville chamberlain hadn't appeased hitler would things have been better? Was he a bad leader for doing that or a good leader for doing that? And I'm just sort of going, well, if you could travel into that other version of history, you know, would it be better? Would it be worse? And um, there's a couple of characters in it who, in, in one version of the history, become sort of well, basically terrorists. And in the other one, they become sort of fascist policemen. And it's pointed out that these people, although they're sort of shaped by experience, they end up with the same sort of um, morals, the same sort of ethics. They're just on completely different sides of the system. So there's stuff in there which I think is quite clever. I mean, it's um, but it's one of those stories where there's people who love it. There's people. There's people that go, "This is the best thing you've ever done, Johnny. Nothing you've done since is any is anywhere near as good." And there's a lot of people who make where it makes them extremely angry, and um, so it's a bit of a flip-flop in that sort of sense, really. <laughs> Doctor Who, flip-flop. Greetings, citizens of Paxatuani. I would like to wish everyone a jubilant Christmas. Any humans found on the streets will be prosecuted. Fatally. This is the only planet in the galaxy where you can find leptonite crystals. Leptonite? Quarks are highly allergic to leptonite, Mel. Do not move. If you attempt to escape, you will be shot with the stun pistol. Are they moving, Sight Guy Potter? No. They're standing quite still, Master. They've put their hands up and everything. So we get the crystals, nip back to the Pinto, and quell the quarks. Oh, I've loved you. I've always loved your body. Let me unwrap it. It is my, my duty to serve my president in any way I can. To the fullest extent of my abilities. Did you see their machine? This blue box. It turned up out of nowhere. It makes sense. Stuart and Reed are in league with the Doctor and Mel, and I ordered them to go back to the Professor's laboratory. And who might you be? Didn't you hear the warning about the enemy agents? Why? We're them. Greetings, citizens of Puxatawney. I would like to wish everyone a somber retribution day. Anyone found outdoors will be reprimanded. Fatally. Right. Now, back against that wall but I will be forced to show you exactly how armed and dangerous we are. OK, 
Okay, I'll jump in. Let's, let's talk about a few others. I know you don't want to talk too much about some of the early stuff, and that's all good. I just want to talk about some of my highlights. Um, Protect and Survive, which was a pretty powerful story with just really Ace and Hex. The Doctor is hardly in it at all. Uh, it's a pretty bleak view of the end of the world in terms of what nuclear war and, and what could be, what could happen at the end. Um, what, what, what was the inspiration for that story and the way you just used Because I think there's only four characters and the Doctor pops in occasionally. Yeah, I mean, um, the inspiration was you just sort of, you try and write about what scares you. And that is something which certainly during the 1980s scared me a great deal. I would have nightmares about it over and over again. Um, and so, and there's, there were things like the, um, there's a TV show called Threads, which did a sort of very sort of realistic take on what a nuclear would, would be like for people on the ground. And I, I think I watched that when I was 10 years old, which was a mistake because I wouldn't watch it now. Um, and the brief for it was kind of very weird because it was um, Sylvester's in Australia doing The Hobbit. So we, you, ha you, can't, you, you, you can have him for a phone call, I think was the original brief. And you, we had, we had um, Sophie and Philip all the way through, and you're allowed two other characters. I think they must have been, they must have been saving money. I think must have, the one I'd done before that must have been more too expensive or something. Mm -hmm. So it was an incredibly difficult brief. Um, and I, I worked out a whole storyline of um, with it just Ace, Hex, and the two sort of, uh, the, the, the husband and the wife. And as I was writing, I got to the end of episode two, and I looked at my synopsis, and on my synopsis, I'd got to the end of episode three. And so I was going, well, I, I've got enough material in my synopsis for one more episode, <laughs> but I've just... I just run out of stuff, um, which, which has never happened before or since. But I just when you're writing, you like I said, you skip through to the next bit, and so in my synopsis, I'd written you know, fifteen minutes of them suffering underground, and I'd written that. I go well, actually, you can get that across in two minutes. You don't need fifteen minutes of people whimpering and groaning. Um, so I emailed Alan Barnes, who's a script editor, and said, look, I've I have absolutely cocked up this one. I've um, I've run out of story. What can I do? And he said, "Oh, we've got good news. We can get we can get Sylvester in for an afternoon with those with the husband and wife actors." So I wrote episode three, going, "Okay, I've got Sylvester. I can do stuff with him now." But um, that's where the structure came from, really. I mean, the, the story was always um, the, other, the other sort of inspiration was the story was um. The TV episode uh, Human Nature, the Paul Cornell one, which um, I loved. I loved a lot um, until the end where the Doctor was sort of doling out these sort of punishments to the family of blood. And it, it was like, what? You no, know, one was turned into a scarecrow, one was stuck in a mirror, one was thrown into a black hole. And I, I just thought, that's not, that's awful. <laughs> it's horrible. It made me quite cross. Um, and so Protect and Survive is going, okay, what happens when the doctor goes around doing these sort of punishments? You know, what happens if you're the person in that, what happens if the doctor's companions get stuck in one of the doctor's um, punishment sort of situations? And um, so, yeah, that, that sort of inspired me because um, I was so angry with the television episode. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it was one of the directions that, that um, Russell was taking Davidson as Doctor was in terms of the, the no second chances, which sort of appears in the first episode, and only only occasionally does it appear, and that's one of the examples of that no second chances appearing. But yeah, it, it's just, it was just the fact that they were sort of um, I don't know. It was the Doctor was in a position to sort of he could have just trapped the whole family on an on an asteroid and left them there, and they'd go. You got a you got a, you got a day to live. It was just the I'm going to force you to have an eternity of um, punishment. It was just, I don't know. It's weird because they only have a very short lifespan normally, I think like a three or four week lifespan, which is why he just thought, if I just hide for a few weeks, they'll be dead. And then in the end, he gives them eternity. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just that, that um, I don't think stories had ended with the Doctor 
deciding to punish the baddies before. And that was an, an, an interesting way for things to go, but it hadn't really been done before because it had been, you know, the, normally the baddies are, are, are blow themselves up or something, which is much more convenient. Um, so yeah, anyway, that for the rights or wrongs of what it was, it did inspire me to do a story. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, protect and survive. Air attack warning. Go to your fallout room or take shelter. Do not panic. Stay calm. This is not a test. Ace, they've only gonna start at World War Three. Four missiles targeted on military targets within the United Kingdom. Albert, cup of tea. Thanks, love. What's that? We're on air. That's something to be grateful for. Come on, let's get some fresh air. After a nuclear explosion, there will be a cloud of deadly dust called fallout. Uh, doors bolted. Albert? It's all right, love. I'm here beside you. Here it comes! The radiation from this dust cannot be seen or smelt, but exposure to it can cause sickness and even death. So the Doctor's behind it all. What do you mean? Well, who died and put him in charge? You cannot leave us, Doctor. You cannot. Enemy missile attack incoming. Have you no mercy? No compassion? No pity? I suggest you take cover. Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. I'm just um, scrolling through your releases and you've you've worked on most most things most ranges what what kind of different challenges would you face um writing a companion chronicle as opposed to say a novel adaptation what kind of different challenges would do both of those styles have well the companion chronicles was a sort of a an unusual situation because i'd gone away from big finish for about three or four years quite a long time and um, I think uh, something had fallen through, but I was asked to do a, the, the Lala Ward Companion Chronicle incredibly quickly. It was written in about two days, and it was recorded, I think, three or four days after that. Something had fallen through at the last minute, and I was brought back in because, <laughs> I don't know, they were thinking, who can write a Tom Baker and Lala Ward story really, really quickly? Then after that, the sort of the range developed because that first one was, uh, I think it was done in the, written in third person, I think, and it was had cliffhangers and stuff, which I really didn't like. Um, and But then we moved into sort of the first person stuff with um, Great Space Elevator. Great Glass and then, uh, Oh, yeah, you are, sorry. Space Elevator, yeah. With... Great Space Elevator. And then um, because other people were doing interesting things in the range, uh, like, you know, Paul Mars and um, John Dorney. The range stop, stopped being companions telling you a story. It became a dramatic, um, a one-person play, basically, or a two-person play. So that by the time you get something like Mastermind, so Mastermind, yeah, it is basically, it's basically a full cast audio that just happens to have a very small cast. It's not really any different from uh it's just it's just another audio drama the different ranges i mean everything has its own sort of challenges i think uh the um adaptations is very interesting because i've done a couple of those i've done and um i've done ones where uh you don't have anything really i mean the the valley of death was based on a sort of a back of an envelope idea really but expanded out into four episodes Whereas uh, uh, the Guardian's prophecy was based on a eighteen-page treatment, and um, damaged goods, which was particularly difficult, uh, was you know based on a novel, a, you know, two hundred and ninety-page novel or whatever, where I had to sort of just write whole scenes of dialogue, where because um, there's so much of the novel was written. Um, in terms of characters' thoughts and their emotional journeys, and it wasn't really a book written in this sort of as a sort of a unmade TV story, which some of the some of the novels were. Mine, I mean, Festo of Death is one of them. Um, so I was very excited to do that because it was like 
even before it had been announced, people were going, oh, well, they're never going to do net damage goods because that's impossible to adapt. No one could do that one. And so I was going, oh, yes. I want to do the one that no one can do. I want to do the one that's impossible because um, that's going to be the hardest one. Um, and I just had so much fun with that um, because Russell's work was carrying me through it. And I was sort of, when I was writing the dialogue, I was, I was writing in a sort of, sort of pastiche of his style. So you wouldn't notice which bits were mine, which bits were his. So you shouldn't notice the join at all. And I sort of managed to work it out. And I was emailing Russell for sort of ideas and suggestions a little bit because he, he'd read the book back and what had gone, there's certain things I want to change because um, in the main one is in the book, I think everyone dies at the end. You know, it's absolutely bloodthirsty. You know, even the nice little kid who's like, dies, everyone dies. And Russell was sort of going back, oh, I wouldn't do that now. I wouldn't kill off the kid now. So can you keep that one alive? Can you keep him alive? Can you keep him alive? Um, so things like that would change and the nature of some characters would change a little bit. And also there were just sort of obvious things, you know, the, the amount of um, sex, drugs and violence uh, had to be increased greatly. <laughs> No, had to, be, had to be toned down, had to be toned down. So, um, because um, Doctor was on television and you have approvals processes and stuff, which never existed in the 1990s. So that was a sort of a huge sort of delight. And they got such a good cast for that. It was just amazing. And the, I listened to a bit of it today. And it just, it does sound fantastic. It, it sounds authentically like a Russell T Davies script from around... Uh, you know, 1998 ish. Because when I, when I was writing it, I was I didn't really watch his Doctor Who's, but I watched things like um, the Second Coming, um, because that was the voice of that was the type of voice I was trying to capture. It's a pretty amazing yeah. work because um, I mean Russell has rewritten so many dozens of different writers pretty comprehensively, and you got to rewrite Russell. So that's a pretty special thing to do. Yeah, um, and he was happy with it. He, I mean. He said very nice things publicly, going, oh, everyone should have added Johnny Morris and Johnny sorted out the story and stuff, which are just obviously I'm sort of floating above the earth, like um, like a, like in a cartoon when a character fall, falls in love and they float along uh, when, I, when I hear that. And he also he sent me some emails, which were also you know, extremely nice about it. Yeah, I mean, but it's a, it was a collaboration, so I can't take credit for it, but... um. It was. I really enjoyed it because it was a technical exercise of just um, pulling scenes together and changing the order of things so that it would work in a different medium. And I think I think if I can adapt that, I can adapt anything. That was the toughest. And um, have I done anything since then? Yes, but it's a secret. Okay. <laughs> There's always those secrets out there. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, though, did the did the authors of those novels get sort of the first option to adapt their own material, or was it always something that uh, Big Finish was going to do? Um, like for instance, did Russell uh, get a, an option to adapt his own book? Um, in every case, they they would have that option. Um, I don't know if it was be, even be stated outright. I think. Um, because I think the idea that Russell would would want to do it, or could, would, um, <laughs> or that they could afford to pay him his normal rate, um, but yeah, they would if, always there was going to have first refus first refusal, yes, um, because um, it has to be done with their permission, and also um, with all of them, as far as I'm aware, they've gone back to the authors once they're a script. So the author can read the script and change anything they're not happy with. Because that happened a little bit with um, Damaged Goods. There were a few bits where Russell was just going, oh, we move that around, can we change that? But there, it, wasn't, it wasn't a lot, and it wasn't really down to dialogue. It was just um, plotting that he fiddled around with a little bit. Um, because I had a really good script editor on that. I had Joe Lidster script editing it, and... Um, his his job was basically to make sure that I 
kept it as Russell's voice and I didn't do anything which was um out which was too you know just too me <laughs> the job was to be anonymous I remember that night like it was yesterday Christmas Eve 1977 the night the tall man came coming soon from Big Finish Productions Doctor Who damaged goods much as I love late 20th century Earth, what are we doing here? Smile. What? Smile, Roz. Smile. Roz and I are trained adjudicators. We have some experience in narcotics investigation. But this is no ordinary investigation. You said you'd make my son better. You said you were doing everything you could. What can you see? Everything. This area is under the control of the British Army. All persons are to be evacuated at once. Must be fought. The war must be won. Remember when I said things might be worse than I thought? Well, they are very much worse. Something has found its way to Earth, and it's older and more dangerous than I thought possible. Doctor, that creature is attacking the building. It killed him. All those people, just like that, for no reason. Remember it, Bell. Remember why it makes you cry? Say it out loud for the first time in your life and it will haunt you no more. Big Finish. We love stories. So um, th- there is a, another uh, adaptation of a uh, run of Russell's short stories coming out soon, isn't there? In the next, is it the next 12 months or so? Uh, you didn't work on that one, did you? Or was that someone else? I didn't. I... I, I... <laughs> I, I have a theory that he might have just written that during lockdown as a joke. I <laughs> don't know one's guessed. Uh, about, no, he wouldn't do that. But that, that okay, because he's far too busy. But no, um, yeah. I mean, everyone has these sort of things in their bottom drawers. Um, now I've got like you know, like I said, I've got dozens of Doctor Who story ideas sitting around, and um, you know, everyone who sort of ended up. Writing for Doctor and TV, they must have all. You know, I think Mark Gatiss has unmade Doctor Who stories as well. Um, you know, from when he was a teenager. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if people like Paul Cornell and Rob Shearman do too. Um, yeah, because it's it's the sort of thing you would do. And also around 1987-ish, when Doctor Who was being opened up to new writers a bit. Um, if you were 25 years old then, it would have been the obvious thing to pitch for. So. Um, so no, he didn't just make it up during lockdown. <laughs> no. So do you have a book of ideas that you intend to, you know, do you keep gathering ideas all the time? How do, you, how do you come up with stuff and what do you do with it when you do? Um, I do have a, a book of ideas. Because uh, whenever you're asked to sort of pitch for something, you sort of, I sort of do six or seven ideas. So for each thing that gets made, there's normally four or five ideas which have been turned down. And some of them obviously are turned down because they're rubbish. <laughs> uh, but some of them I go, no, that's still a really good story. That's a really good idea. Um, and so I'll leave it for a couple of years and then I'll put that idea back in again. And David Richardson or someone go, no, we're still not going to do that story, Jake. We're still not doing that one. Um, because he would, he would remember from the um, so I do have a sort of list. And very recently, when I had to do one quite quickly, I did a story called um, Lightspeed, which had been sort of on my list for about 10 years. I've been sort of pitching it as a sixth Doctor story, as a seventh Doctor story, as a hour-long thing. Um, over Because I was convinced it was a really good idea. Um, I mean, other people might. <laughs> Other people's mileage may vary, but I thought it was a very strong idea, and I thought it was a very obvious thing to do. I thought it was, you know, I, could, I could easily imagine it being done in in Russell's TV show of going, the Doctor's trapped in a spaceship that can't go under the speed of light. It's an obvious gag, but it's a it's a strong story. Um, but that said, um, generally speaking, the stuff that's got made, the stuff that's been commissioned, has been stuff where I've come up with something new. I mean, that's the that's the, that's the hard bit. That's a, like um. That's having to use a muscle in my brain because you're sort of going, what hasn't? Because you're going, what hasn't been done? You know, which which periods of history hasn't the doctor been to before? 
um, what type of you know situations hasn't he been before? And you're sort of trying to find something which is new and which is which is hopefully sort of scary or funny or has some sort of um, emotional resonance or something. So, and it's something which excites me as a writer, something where I go, oh, that's what this story is about. That's the thing. Um, that's what I love about it. And I think that's sort of true of, of nearly all of them, that there's always something in there where I've gone, that's what, it, that's what excites me. And it's just writing, it's trying to make sure that that bit, that, that germ of the idea isn't lost. I wanted to ask you about the, those stories in the bottom of your drawer. Now, if if anyone does have stories in the bottom of their drawer, what would you suggest to anyone who wants to uh, get into writing? How would they how would they do that? It seems like a lot of you fellows back in the in the nineties were in the right place at the right time. Is that is that pretty much how it was for you, or is is there some systematic way someone can get into writing these days? Has it all changed since then? Um, well, well, I. I... I don't feel like I was in, in any sort of right place at any sort of right time because I I sort of came in at the very the tail end of it. Um I was sort of one of the last <laughs> to come through that way. Um and I only sort of came in because much better writers like Gareth Roberts and Mark Gatiss and so on had all gone, all kind of all leaving. They'd all stopped doing the books, and so there was a sort of vacancy. Um I'm very sort of loath to give advice to writers um, because, um, I mean, if you want to know how to write a big Finnish audio, I'm happy to sort of give it, you know, blow by a list of, of things to do and all things not to do as well. But um, in terms of career, I'm not, I don't feel I'm in a position to give advice uh, because I've had huge, wonderful breaks which have ended in nothing. and um it's the same for everyone i mean you just have to keep sort of plugging away um i mean if someone wanted to get into big finish i what i would what i would say is write um some really good original scripts send them to an agent get an agent these are all things which are quite possible which are quite doable and when you have an agent get that agent to approach big finish because Big Finish gets a lot of um, submissions from sort of random, out of, out of the blue, it gets lots of submissions. But if they get, when they get a, a submission with an agent attached to it, they will read it and, um, and has a good chance of going forward, I think. But um, that's, that's what I'd do. Because, but uh, obviously, Getting an agent isn't easy, but I think um, that's one way in. Big Finish does um, the, the various writing competitions and stuff, which is how they found people like Matt Fitton and so on. So that's a way in. Um, when I was doing Breaking Bubbles, I was um, the first and last time I was trying to find new writers. And what I was doing was just going who's done good stuff in Doctor Who fandom, who's done uh, good articles or is just, you know, and so I got Una McCormack in, I got Liz Miles in, and I got um, Mark, Ra Mark Ravenhill, the sort of, which I thought was a big coup <laughs> to get a, you know, this award-winning um, playwright to write a Doctor Who story. Um, but I did find it very difficult because, um, the situation of fanzines and stuff has sort of gone away where people would, um, you know, during the 1980s, people would write short stories for fanzines and they get edited and published. So there's already a sort of nursery slope um, into writing. Um, so, yeah, I think that the job with all writing is just to sort of get yourself known, get yourself trusted and sort of, and okay, I'll give one bit, one tiny piece of writing advice, which is, um, which isn't from me. It's something. It's, but if you can, if you can hand in a piece of work which is the right length, and it's on time, and it's good, if you can do two of those three things, 
you're better than most. If you can do three things, and I can, and I can do script, good, on time, right length, that's what you need to do. Um, because it sounds silly, but most people can't do all three. And that's the job. You mentioned fanzines a moment ago. I guess there was a different environment in the past where uh, you had to do those things. The, the fanzine was coming out. You had to get your, your, your story in before it got published. It was, as you said, being edited by the people. You know, you know it's too long. We, we've only got three pages. You've got to cut it down. So a lot of skills were being taught, which the internet doesn't allow for. Because the internet, people can just keep writing for as long as they want. No one edits them. And now there's a the pressure in terms of the BBC now actually saying we can't actually publish anything on the internet. So they're coming down and stopping new writers, new fan, new fan fiction happening on the internet. Uh, are we going to run out of writers? Uh, no, <laughs> there's no chance of that. Um, because the other way, I mean, um, is if you do a creative writing course at university or something, that's another way in. Because that will give you you know, three years of time and of and have something for people looking at your work. And so there's, there'll be keep it, there's people coming through that sort of area. Um, every town has its own sort of writer's club and stuff where people can get people to give feedback. Um, because when you're writing something, feedback is incredibly useful. Um, when you've finished it and it's gone out, uh, feedback is almost entirely useless. Um, but um, when, when it's during the writing process, when you're being script edited, or, you know, uh, certainly in the early days, I, whenever I was writing a script, I'd send it to my friends so that they could say what they liked about it and what didn't work. So with, with Festival of Death, for instance, I think they had about a read-through crew, as it was called, of about 20 people. Um, with people like, certainly like Matt Kempton and stuff. And Mark Michalowski were, were giving really useful notes all the way through. So there was that sort of community there. Um, I, I can't really speak with any sort of, I don't know what the situation with um, fan stuff is at the moment, but I, I see some incredibly sort of innovative um, creations on the internet of people doing stuff with CGI and um, things. And the technology is almost there. So People can do broadcast quality stuff, whether it's radio or video. So I think there'll always be a way through. I mean, it's and it's always going to be difficult. It's always going to be. It's always been difficult, and it's there was never a good time. Um, so, and it certainly wasn't the time I came through because I came in, I came in the, the the second wave. Do you have any favourite ranges or teams that you like to write for? I think we're lucky. I think there's there's pretty much all the doctors and all the companions are really good actors. So you always sort of feel slightly sort of blessed when they take a script and make it better, make it sound better. I really like um, the character of Tegan. I think she's a, and um, Janet Fielding does it, is a great actress. And, and I really liked writing for Flip because uh, I created the character. So so I, I I feel particularly sort of proprietorial towards that character, and Lisa Greenwood is a fantastic actress. Um, so I like that. I was very, but I get excited when it's um a new one. Really, I was sort of just so excited when I was doing them, a River Song story, and when I was doing Missy, and when I was doing um David the David Tennant story, and I've just done one for War Doctor. And um, it's the new ones, you know, it's the ones you haven't done before, because <laughs> obviously I'm an obsessive fan and it's the ticking, it's the process, the feeling of ticking it off the list. So I just sort of go, well, I haven't done, who haven't I done? I haven't done, you know, I haven't done a Cyberman story, you know. <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, that's what keeps me awake at night. <laughs> that I, I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, a story that you wrote that relates to uh, the background behind me, and I was today listening to uh, the recently released The Nightmare Realm, and as I was listening to it, uh, it's not a big finished story, released on BBC uh, Audio, and as I was listening to it, I was thinking, this is a homage to the the Twilight Zone, 
Uh, and of course, it's very clear by the end of it that that, that it is. Um, are you also a fan of the the Twilight Zone, Outer Limits? That because I tend to, I've got a I've got a portable drive where I've ripped all my DVDs onto the drive, and I occasionally put on uh, the Twilight Zone, and it never ceases to amaze me how good that show is. Uh, is that how you feel about the Twilight Zone as well? Yes, I, I um. I think I got the DVDs maybe about uh, 10 years ago. I don't know. Um, you know, box set by box set. And I did watch it obsessively. And I was just sort of amazed by um, how good it, how good writing uh, Rod Serling was and how, you know, how, how prolific he was, how disciplined he was, how fast he was, <laughs> and how he just kept on coming up with these ideas, which... Um, you know, some of them are sort of, you know, are cliches now, but he wasn't coming up with a new, he was coming up with them the first time over and over again. And there's sort of other, obviously there's, other, there's, there's three or four other sort of great writers who are involved with that series. Um, but yeah, and I think it was, a, it was an ideal format of, you know, 22 minutes, because that's what you do for now for Netflix. You go, that's the sort of, if you've got one idea in a story, 22 minutes is, is the sort of ideal length to tell it. Um, there's you know, things like Black Mirror and stuff, which is a sort of similar thing. I just watched that going, yeah, but you could have done this in 22 minutes. Because <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a busy but busy person, you know. I, I, I can't spend, you know, 90 minutes on a story <laughs> if, it's only, if it's only one idea. Um, so, yeah, I was absolutely in awe of what's selling. Um, and uh, so yeah, that that was the idea to do a sort of a tribute, and um, and yeah, I it, that was one of those ideas I, I I had had kicking around for a while. It was just a, it's a sort of twist on the, the land of fiction idea, but what if it was all one person's work of fiction? Yeah, no, no, it's uh, it's it's a really nice homage. It had me smiling uh, all the way through. So. Uh, I really enjoyed it. What were, what were your thoughts on on Dan Starkey's uh, rendition of it? Because I thought he was amazing. Uh, well, I, I know Dan. He's a, he's, a, he's a friend of mine. I've been to the pub with him a couple of times, and uh, um, he did a fantastic job. I mean, his impression of Matt Lucas was as Nardol. Spot on. He's just fantastic. I mean, I was going, oh, oh. <laughs> when I heard that, I was going, I would have given him more to do if I knew he could do that. Um, and his parody one is, is great. I mean, I had written it, um, sort of hoping that Matt Lucas would be the narrator. Um, because you do, you, you have an idea of going, oh, we would be good if they could get him. Um, but then when Dan Starkey can do Matt Lucas's voice, you go, actually, we don't need, actually, we don't need Matt Lucas. No. That Matt who? I've forgotten him already. No, Dan, Dan can do that now. So yeah, and um, he's doing another one of my things uh, soon if he hasn't already done it. So yeah, there's going to be another one in a sort of similar vein coming up soon. Okay, so uh, do you know, are we going to see more of these uh, style releases coming from BBC Books? I know there's uh, three or four coming out this year, but um, they're going to I, increase that? I don't, I don't know. Um, they've asked me to do some more if I have any ideas. Um, and I'm just in a sort of position of going, but I'm too busy to do anything at the moment, um, which is a lovely position to be in. Um, when when things start flagging, I'll, I'll start pitching more ideas to them. Um, I don't quite know what the situation is there, so I can't, um, because even The Night of Realm took a long time to come out from when it was written and recorded, so I don't know. I think, I mean... It's it's an odd situation because this is um, it's sort of in competition with Big Finish, um, so I don't know. I don't know. I'm just I'm just a sort of I, I'm a freelance writer for hire, so I I can't speak on behalf of anything beyond that. How did they approach you originally, the BBC? Um, that came through Michael Stevens, who um, I think I'd done stuff with before i can't remember i think he just knew me from the books 
or I can't because I'd also because I'd done the, the the Monster Vault book around then at the same time, and uh, I can't remember what it, what it else we did, but um, because there'd been other things sort of mooted in the past, because you know, for everything that happens, there's another thing mooted. So I and I'd met him a couple of times. I know I'd met him, so <laughs> I don't know. This is one of those one of those things again. When when did you meet this person again? I have no memory of ever meeting this person. I know I've met them, but not not the first time, so I don't know. Now, one of my favourite stories is the antimatter with Mary Tam and Tom Baker, because you did a lot of writing for Tom early on. That's the antimatter, isn't it? Aunt, what does anti? What does I say? You always say anti. <laughs> anti? Anti? I think I'm saying anti. Anti-matter. The um, anti-matter, um, which is yeah, just, just fast. It's hilarious. I'm just wondering in terms of how that came about. Um, and also, you can write totally bleak and depressing when it comes to things like um, protecting, you know, sort of protecting survival we talked about earlier, and yet this is total farce. What's, what's your preferred method? Do you like comedy more than the serious stuff, or do you, you know, combination of which? How that came about was um, I was asked to do a Tom Baker and Romana story because... I hadn't done anything for their first series and I was slightly annoyed by that. Um, so they made up for it by getting me to do two stories in the second year. And I just wanted to do a sort of a, a PG Woodhouse story. And what if PG Woodhouse, you know, the Jeeves and Worcester and Blandings and stuff, if he'd written a Doctor Who story in 1978, what would it have been like? Um, so I had a lot of fun with that. I mean, in terms of drama and comedy, I think comedy is harder because you have to write each line. In comedy, you have to write each line over and over again until you've nailed the absolute rhythm. And then you know when you've got it right because it's funny. Um, whereas writing anything else, you don't, you're doing all the same. You're doing writing character, you're writing scares, you're writing um, conflict and suspense and all things um but without the added complication i mean because comedy is an extra discipline but it also means it's an extra way of testing a testing a scene or testing a line because when you know when it's funny you go that's it i can move on but with the antimatter it was it was very much in a sort of a pg woodhouse vein so i was on top of that i was going i they need to be sort of pg woodhouse type jokes um, because there's nothing in there which is taken from his books. There's no um, there's no jokes I've nicked or anything like that. Um, but they're all sort of similar style. Um, so there's things like a, a line about um, if he took all his aunts and laid them out end to end, they'd 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 run from I don't know Pall Mall to Oldwich and be a hazard to traffic. <laughs> and you just sort of go. That's a PG Woodhouse sort of joke um, of taking a metaphor and just taking it a little bit, to stretching it becomes so it becomes silly. Um, but that's not from any book. But that when I was writing that, I was reading them over and over again uh, just to get that voice in my head, to get that sort of vocabulary and that sort of characterization. So that 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 one, I mean, that turned out fantastic. Well, it was a very very happy experience. So in terms of writing comedy or writing adventure oh, or writing I, horror? Did I, not, did I not answer the question? I think comedy is harder, but um, I. this is going back to the first question. People tell me I'm good at it, and I like people telling me I'm good at something. And certainly when I've done Doctor Who comedy episodes, they've gone down really well. Um, as Max Warp is a comedy one. And uh, and that seems those, those that, that seems to be the sort of area. and outside of Doctor Who I write comedy a lot. I was going to say you work on a project Dick Dixon in the twenty first century. I listened to that today. Yeah, so that's 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 me writing what I want to write. That's that is comedy. So and I've written two more episodes, and that is a it is a discipline because um, if someone's if someone's sort of pointing a gun at your head saying, say something funny, you know, it's incredibly difficult. 
but um, and with, with Dick Dix and I have this sort of the framework, which is like a Doctor Who thing of telling a very sort of traditional science fiction story and just allowing myself to go off at tangents. Uh, so it's very similar to what I did with sort of Max War and the antimatter in that way. Now you said, oh, sorry, I was going to say, we just about on Dick Dixon. So you're still trying to get some funding for that? Is that that's a project, a love project you, you're trying to self fund to get it happening? Uh, um, no, it's um, it's happening. We've been doing, I've written episodes two and three. We're getting the actors together um, when they're available, and we'll record two more episodes. And we've, they've been pre-ordered on the website, and when they out, more people can buy them and download them. And then there's a couple more scripts I want to make. So because of remote recording, you know, because um, of things like this, basically, um, the cost of recording an audio has dropped a lot because you, you don't need to hire a studio and hiring a studio for a day is not cheap. All the other costs are the same in terms of the actor's time and the, the engineering and the post-production, the sound and the music and so on. Um, but it becomes much more affordable. And at the moment, I think I'm going, I can just about justify it in terms of expense. And it would just be, it was just about getting other stuff out there really, because um, I have all these scripts and projects which haven't been made. And if I can make them myself and just get them out there, it feels like all the time and effort I put into them hasn't been wasted, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, because, you know, I have like dozens of sitcom scripts and drama scripts which where, where, you, where you write them and you spend like a month on them or whatever, you make them really, really good. And they go off to your agent and your agent reads them. Everyone in the agency reads it. So that's about six or seven people. And then it gets sent out to TV companies or whatever. And over about a year, maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen people read the script. And that, that's it. And you sort of, so when you're writing something, if you're writing it, sitting there and going, this script might be read by, by nearly 24 people. That's not, that's not really very exciting. Thing. That's not much of a, it's very hard to get enthusiastic about the prospect of writing a script that's going to be read by 20 people who don't like it very much. Whereas if you're writing a script going, and this is going to get made, and this is going to have really good actors in it, and this is going to be professionally designed and um, and it's going to be put out there and sold or given or streamed for free or whatever, but it's actually going to get made. Where, you, where every time you type a word on the screen, you know that that, that word is going to be said by an actor and it's going to be in the finished product. That makes it a much, much more exciting way of writing. Because obviously with specs, because you're trying to fool yourself into thinking it's going to get made, um, even though you know it probably won't. But if you know it's certainly going to get made, it makes a big difference makes a big difference in how you write and, um, and it makes it much better. So yeah, that's the answer. Well, if you like being told that uh, your stuff is good, I can tell you, Johnny, uh, your stuff is very good. <laughs> you're, you're probably for me on, on that list of writers for, for Big Finish in particular, who if I see your name on something, I, I am, I'm very comfortable that I'm going to be satisfied with uh, with with what I am about to listen to. Uh, there's some writers who I don't know so well. I I, th I think, oh, I wonder how this is going to go. But I know that no matter what you do, um, I'm usually going to be pretty pretty satisfied with it. So so thank you. I like thank you. I like the usually. <laughs> I, like the, I mean, there's um. I think I was just I was talking uh, with Matt Fitton again. I was explaining, going, 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 John Dorney is, um, I'm a much more versatile writer than John Dorney. Because John Dorney can only write good stories, whereas I can write bad <laughs> ones as well. Uh, that's good. But there's, there's been a couple which have gone down where, where I've sort of wrote a script which I thought was fantastic, and then people didn't agree with me. <laughs> but never mind. How do you, how do you react when you do get a bad reaction in terms of I mean I mean fandom is happy to be very vocal, so yeah are they 
Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> um, so I, mean, I don't know if you want, want to name what what anyone in, anything in particular, but what what are some stories in terms of that had you don't think went down well, and what well, how do people react, and how do you react when people are negative? Firstly, if, if someone's paid for something, they're absolutely entitled to say what they like about it. You know, you you pay your money, that's the deal. And it's nice. To, it's always nice to hear good people have enjoyed something. Um, the problem is if they haven't enjoyed something, it's too late to fix it. Because no matter how good their criticism is, you go, well, I wrote that five years ago or whatever. Um, it's too late to fix it now. And I'm never going to write that story again. I'm never going to be making those choices again. Um, so even bearing in mind the criticism, that's not going to help me improve. So yeah, make sure it's annoying in a way, but I think there's sort of two things. One is going, well, I, I got employed again. So if the people who, who pay the money hire you again for another job, you haven't, you haven't cocked it up. By, by the time things get reviewed or whatever, I've moved on. I've gone on to the next thing. So it always feels like um, this is sort of history, really. And going with, I mean, certainly with things like some of the Tom Baker ones, like, um, like Day of the Comet, where that was written so long ago. I and mean, then it came out about six years after I wrote it or whatever. So when people are listening to it now and saying what they think about it, I'm going, well, I can barely remember that being recorded. I can't remember writing it. I'm so detached from the project now that people being critical of it doesn't touch me because it's, 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 it feels so distant. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's sort of the way. I mean, it's disappointing because um, sometimes when when things haven't been got how you hope they'd be get. Because um, in the one is um, Revenge of the Swarm, which I think was where I was trying to do something quite sort of tricky of doing a sort of a mashup of 1970s Doctor Who and 1980s Doctor Who and with a sort of a, a clever sort of time travel twist. Um, everyone hated it. But I, I, but I, when I when I did the script, I thought this is the best structured story I've ever done. I really nailed the structure of that. Did um, you say everyone hated it? I well, loved it. Well, <laughs> yes. I mean, that's the thing because there's always someone who likes it. Um, I think if Nick Briggs had directed it, it would have he would have got the tone a bit closer to what I meant wanted to be. Um, because also some of it had so many silly jokes in it, and a, and a lot of those got cut out, which I think pushed it in a way in a direction it wasn't. It made it much more it's like it's a serious thing, and um, where I'd sort of where I'd kept putting these little jokes in to undercut it, so that people sort of felt um, that I knew how ridiculous it was. But I, and but I don't know. I mean. Um, but like, if you enjoy, if you enjoyed it, I know there are lots of people out there enjoyed it. So yeah. How how do you get perception that it hasn't gone down well? I know. Um, I mean, with the River Song box set earlier in the year, my favourite story on the box set was your story with her and the mechanoids and the introdu introduction of Mark Seven and your kingdom. You're trying to do a lot of things. River was hilarious. I mean, there were so many hilarious lines, and then the whole setup was brilliant. And yeah, she was gorgeous. Um, but I know talking to you earlier, you had a perception that that wasn't well received. Where, where do you get the impression that it's not well received? Oh, uh, just, you know, idly looking at forums and stuff. I, I don't tend to read the reviews. I just look at the scores at the bottom. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't be bothered to go, go, what, what, go, oh, God, four out of ten? Oh, you know. It's worth at least a seven, I think, you know. But but they could also, be rating the box set as a whole, as opposed yeah, they, to your exactly, single story. Yeah, they could be, they, I think I think the cover is what they're talking about. And but also, <laughs> it is it is one of those things of um. If, if there's two ways of reasons for not liking a story, there's you don't like what the story is trying to do, or you don't think the story did the writer did it very well, and with some of them. What I was, if you like with um, Revenge of the Swarm, if you don't like um, The Invisible Enemy, no matter how good my script is, people are going to, they'll still think it's, it's not going to be to their taste. Um, 
because they think what I was trying to do was a bad idea. And so with, with the mechanoid story as well, there's going to be people going, well, bringing back the mechanoids is rubbish, which is a perfectly valid, perfectly valid opinion. Um, but um, if that's how they're coming into the story, then no matter how well I write it, they're still going to think it's rubbish. Um, so unless I sort of do some sort of dark Christopher Nolan take on the mechanoids, but I don't want to, didn't want to, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to write a sort of, wanted to take River Song and stick her in, a, in the Terry Nation universe, um, which that is what I was trying to do. And, and people who, who think that's a good idea, who like what the story was trying to do, they maybe appreciate it for, for achieving that quite well. But, you know, it, that's, that's, but if people don't like what the story is trying to do, if, if, um, if it's bringing back a monster they don't like or, um, or, com or companions in it they don't like, or, you know, if it's, if the premise of the story isn't to their taste in the first place, it's, is, I'm not saying it's impossible to please them, but it's certainly, difficult. Um, it's, it's harder, it's harder, yeah. So what's, what's your list of, what haven't you got to write for yet? Who haven't you written for yet? What's your, what's on your bucket list still? Uh, well, uh, I've sort of done most things, so I'm quite, I'm happy, but I just want to keep going. Keep going is the main one. Um, and to not repeat myself, because um, I've always tried to be different. Um, um, and even if I feel like I'm do I've done something before, I really push against it. I mean, for years, I had a rule that I would never use the same word twice in a title. So um, after I did Fast for Death, I spent years going, I can't use the word death in a story. Um, so things like, so always trying to do something different. I mean, um, and when I was doing Prisoners of Fate, the Peter Davison one, I'd written a scene, scene of the, the TARDIS picking up a distress signal or something like that. And as I was writing, going, I've written this scene before. I've I've written the fifth Doctor Tegan and Turlo picking up a distress signal. I cut, and as soon as it felt like something I'd done before, I threw it out. I was going, if I'm if I'm writing this and I'm getting bored or feeling that this is old hat, the listener's going to feel that as well. So it's, it's, it's a sense of just, like I said earlier, of finding the thing that excites me about it. And what excites me about any story is doing something I haven't done. Um, you know, going to a, using a monster I haven't used before or, um, or a character I haven't done, used before. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of exciting that they're sort of doing stuff with, um, you know, we now have, Sarah stories and Harry and stuff. So there's more sort of companions to play with who weren't there before. Um, and Liz Shaw, you know, so you can you can do stuff where you couldn't do it before, I think. Um, oh, they've even they've even bought they've, they've recast Dodo as well, haven't they? So so there's a whole the, so yeah, it'd be lovely to write write a story with Dodo in, that sort of thing. Um, but oh, it is just usually so that the bucket list is just to keep going, which is difficult. And it's always going to it's going to stay difficult because there's more people coming through. Lots of people are doing very very good work, and you just want to sort of keep your head above water. You want to sort of keep justifying your existence, really. I think one of the most exciting announcements for the classic Doctors uh, releases next year is the um, the second Doctor series six B. Uh, box set that's coming out. So, did you have anything to do with any any stories in that set at all? Uh, Second Doctor stories? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, it's, um, no, I'm not involved with that. I'd like. I, I think that's kind of interesting. An interesting way way to go. Um, um, no, I, the the stuff I have coming up. I have a. War Master begins story uh, called um, Saviour, which is you know with the Daleks and stuff, uh, which 
I'm very excited about because that's another one where I was, I was writing it. I'd sort of created this situation of the Doctor versus the Daleks. I, don't, I think that's not really a spoiler to tell you that. Um, but where it was a sort of a, a where the, the drama kept on popping out, where things became much more dramatic as I was writing, going, oh my God, that, that, this character really comes alive. This character's position in the story is actually sparking and creating an argument and stuff. So that, I think that was a really strong script. Um, Were you able to be at uh, those recordings at all? Uh, virtually at all? Uh, virtually, no. I mean, since they've, with the with sense of lockdown, I was at the recording, the virtual recording for Genetics of the Daleks. Um, but that's the only one. And I can understand why, because, you know, at a recording, the writer is always sort of there under a sort of sufferance anyway. Um, because the writer should have finished their job by that point, really. You know, they should have, the script should be done, make sense before the actors come into the room. And certainly with Genetics of the Darks, I was sitting there and going, it was lovely to listen to it being recorded. Um, and it was lovely to listen because there's nothing for me to do. You know, it finished. I'd, I'd written this script and it worked. And, um, and the, the actors sort of, um, they got a really good cast in. And so it lifted it. Um, Did you have Tom Baker wanting to tweak any bits of your script at all? Like uh, he's known to do? Um, not for that one. I mean, Tom has done that in the past, and I feel honoured in a way because it's just, um, I mean, with the antimatter and stuff, that was the first time that happened, I think. He'd come in with the script and it had like it writing all over it because he'd changed lines. And I was going, this is really cool. You know, I've, Tom Baker, he's read my script, always cool in the first place, and He's engaged with it so much that he's just gone through adding three or four of his own little extra jokes. And then in the green room before calling, goes, so you're Johnny, you wrote it. What do you think about this line? Is this okay? Can I put this one in? He was asking my permission. Tom Baker, you know, he never asked the permission like. in the 70s. <laughs> he would just do it anyway. Uh, and I was just going, yes to everything. Going, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Because also, Tom Baker adding his own little extra jokes is authentic, absolutely authentic Doctor Who. So I listen to it now, and I say, no, it's a bit smile, going, that's Tom's bit, that is. That's, that's where he asked me if he could put that joke in. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's happening less now with um, remote recording, um, because, you know, Tom's recording from home and stuff, so, uh, yeah, there's going to be less of that now. But hopefully, hopefully we'll be back in the studio again one day. Okay, news flash. This isn't my wedding. And this isn't 1944. Doctor, you said you were taking me home. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Don't answer that phone. Doctor Who. Static. Don't answer it. Leave it alone. Hello? <laughs> Big finish. We love stories. Uh, come on, Constance. Breathe. Breathe. She's Breathe. gone, Doctor. Uh, She's no, dead. No. I can bring her back. I can save her. It's too late, Doctor. Oh, Constance. Never giving up. Never giving in. Never giving up. Well, there you go, Jonathan Morris. Thank you very much for spending some time with us and, and, and chatting about your work and the process of writing for Big Finish, been doing it for such a long time. It was a good one, wasn't it, Philip? It was great. He's got so much knowledge and 
Yeah, been around for a long time. Great stories. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, let's uh, dive into our recommendations for this week just before we uh, head off for the episode. And um, I reckon, let me just check. Let me just double check. Uh, I think it might be your turn to go first, Philip. Are you sure? I Hang on. Yep, I am. Positive. Well, there we go then. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to recommend something that uh, I've just listened to, to from Big Finish and enjoyed, and I think we've talked about it a bit. Um, the new Missy box set. Uh, I'm not sure. If you I haven't heard it yet. Oh, you not heard it? It is hilarious. Um, I th- it's interesting. What? Yeah, I just I love what they've done with Missy and the Monk. I think the two of them are together are just so funny, and they do such clever, bizarre things. Um, the whole f- yeah. Actually, I can't give. I can't talk about it without giving spoilers. Um, a little bit I'll give away is the very first episode has um, Missy just walking around with the monk's head in a, a carpet bag. Um, okay. Just, just, just his brain. He's, she's taken the brain out, left the body behind in the TARDIS, and she just has his brain. The brain of Monkeyus. It's the brain of Monkeyus in a, in a Hessian bag. And there's even a ravine that happens in there as well. But okay. it, is, it is just so funny. And just how clever Missy is in terms of manipulating people and situations but does it with a smile, and you just keep laughing. She's just, yeah. Michelle Gomez is just crazy. I, I don't know how they script script it, whether she, they just give her the words, and she works out what she's going to do with each line, because nearly every line is different, and it's not at all what you expect in terms of how the lines are delivered. But it's just the most amazing performance, and her and Rufus Hound together, Michelle Gomez and Rufus Hound, amazing performance. So if you, what, about, uh, what about The Nun? How are you feeling about The Nun? Um, oh, she's only in one episode. Right. Um, yeah, the nun's okay. Because I've got to say, uh, if, if for any listener who hasn't heard it yet, she did appear in an earlier release this year, so I, I, I won't give that away, but I've got to say that, what's the, what's the actress's name? Gemma, Gemma Whelan? Is that who it is? I was, was going to say Gemma Whelan, but I wasn't sure I was right, so there you go. Um... There was a lot of there was a lot of talk about Gemma and and her performance uh, because of her appearing in Game of Thrones, but I've never seen Game of Thrones, so I, I felt slightly under underwhelmed because I felt I should be more excited, like other people were excited. It's a bit like Maisie Williams in the in the TV show. They're saying, "Oh, she's from Game of Thrones," so wow. And I'm thinking, "Yeah, so." Um, it, and I don't know whether it detracted from my enjoyment of the episode or not, but yeah, I just had a slight feeling of of uh, of underwhelm there uh, with uh, with this character. So yeah, I'll, I'll wait and reserve my judgment until I've heard the the, the box set uh, this time. So um, yeah, that's just the, my two cents about that. There's certainly a play between Gemma Whelan and Rufus Hound uh, in in the episode that she's in, and you can see it's got potential in terms of going further, but. Yeah, nothing. I don't think it stands out like Michelle Gomez and Rufus Howe do. I think those two, but but you you can't bring a third utterly crazy character in easily. I think yeah, you can only manage a couple of crazy characters in a show. Otherwise, it just gets ridiculous rather than funny. Okay. But anyhow, I think you'll enjoy it. I smiled all the way through it, even though there's awful things happening, and there's times you just gotta go like this is so bad, but you can't help smiling at how bad it is. So that's my Very recommendation. Good. Yeah, what about you, Dwayne? What are you going to recommend? Okay, I'm going to recommend a podcast to start with and then a book slash audio book that, uh, that it drove me to. So, you know, I like my true crime. So one of the podcasts I listen to is uh, called Australian True Crime. And I don't listen to all episodes of these podcasts. Just from time to time, I'll listen to something but while i was away recently philip the title of one of the episodes popped up and it intrigued me because it said jack the ripper australian true crime question mark and i'm a bit fascinated with the jack the ripper case so i had to go in and and have a listen to that now uh this podcast is hosted by michelle laurie so she's a very well-known australian uh, media figure i find her a little bit irritating personally but I still like the way she presents and she was interviewing an author uh, called Gary Linnell who has written a book uh, called The Devil's Work and it's about a a character called 
not a character, a, a man called Frederick Deeming, who was very famous for the absolute brutal murders of several. He was a serial bigamist and he would marry someone and then have kids and then he would murder them and then move on to another place. And he actually was linked to the Jack the, Jack the Ripper case and ended up in Melbourne. So he was eventually tried and hanged in Melbourne uh, for murdering someone out here. But he got worldwide fame. And the story, the way the story was told in the podcast was uh, pretty fascinating. It was great to hear that. So by the end of, the, by the end of that podcast, I went straight to the book. Uh, it, the audio book is, is read by Peter Phelps. So he's oh, a, famous, okay. a famous Australian uh, actor. Sons and who, daughters. Well, I, I, I used to really like Stingers as well. So Peter starred yeah. in that uh, for, for many years. Um, but I didn't get the book. I, I didn't get the audio. I've gone for the book. So I just bought a, a Kindle version. I've uh, started devouring it that way. But I put links to the podcast and to the book in the show notes for anyone who is into true crime and how anyone who's interested in Jack the Ripper links may find this very interesting, uh, just as I did. So that's my recommendation for this week. Hmm. You know, you, there's some things you listen to, you think that you were not as nice and sweet as you are, Dwayne. There's murder, mayhem, death and destruction that you love. Oh, you find art in the darkest places. <laughs> so you do. <laughs> All right, that, that'll do us for this time. Uh, re- once again, thank you, Jonathan Morris. It's been great to, uh, to have you on. Thank you, Philip. And thank you all for listening and watching. See, See you next you time. This has been The Sirens of Audio, episode 78, with special guest Jonathan Morris and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music is by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, and your favourite podcast app. Find links to all our socials and other info at sirensofaudio.com. Keep listening to audio drama, because audio drama...